you, you know, in your face now. I mean, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Did we ever think we had individual rights? Uh, you know, I certainly didn't because I saw it from the inside out from a very young age. But did people really think they were free to, to, to you know, do what they want and, you know, to have a dream and to run after it? Did they really think that, that, that they could do that on their own? Or did they believe somewhere deep down they needed to get permission? Most everyone I know deep down knows they need to get permission. They just, it's just ingrained into them. And, uh, Right? I, I, you know, it's ingrained in me somewhat. I mean, I'm thinking, don't I need permission? You know, the, I mean, I've found so many things I thought I needed permission on. Or, you know, is it okay to, you know, remember that song, a Sly and the Family, Thank You for Letting Me Be Myself Again? I think that's about a serial rapist. No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, you, you know, but right, but it's not up to you to let me be myself. See, I don't have to thank you. There's a flaw in that equation of that song even if I might like the song, the, 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 the equation, thank you for letting, you know, allow me to be without freaking out that I'm me and now you're still around. <clears throat> you didn't reject me. Oh, no, it, it, it really, if I have to pretend to be something else so you won't reject me, uh, you will eventually reject me anyway. It's never going to be like the feeling you have with, you know, real brothers and sisters a like-minded spirit or whatever, you know, it's not going to be like that. So it'd be like when we pretend around each other, you know, it's only a matter of time before that just kind of blows. I mean, it's not going to, uh, you, you know, uh, when people have that feeling, that connection, like a family connection, they could be, we're downright ugly around each other. And then it doesn't, it doesn't uh, blow anything. It's just family, you know, family affair, right? It's a family affair. Slime family starting again. It's a family affair. Ah, family affair. It's a family affair. You know, uh, you know, oh, sorry I yelled and screamed and, you know, it's okay. It's all right. Hey, it's cool, man. I understand, you know. Now that is uh, normal. Each of us have different personalities. You know, some are strong and dominant. Some are, you know, weak, and some are in the middle. But there's a there's always a pecking order that develops. And then people scream and yell. And they challenge the order, and then there's fights, and that's all actually normal. I'm talking about when you are in a situation with you know strangers, and you try to act like them to fit in because it's a because you it's a good job. You're going to get money, so you're really happy to be there because that's what you really want to bring home the bacon. You know, uh, you know, dear wifey is uh, about to, to drop your second kid and you want to live in that house on the hill and you've got that, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the mortgage payment on the Beamer <laughs> while you're renting the house trying to show off. Anyway, so there you are. And, you know, it's a room. I'm thinking of a room full of like real estate agents, right? You know, they're all in their cubicles. They look up above the cubicles. They, they size you up and you say, hey, what's happening? Hey, how are you? Hey, I got some tickets to the game this weekend. I can't go. Are you interested? You try to bribe your way in there and stuff and you start putting on an act and you're just like them. And before you know it, you look out the window. And by Jove, your car is not in the place it was supposed to be. And now you're getting a ticket. So you tell the office manager, hey, I parked in the right space. And they moved it. They moved the car. And the guy looks at you like, I'm not. So they go down to straighten it out with a cop. He goes, no, the car's right here. You can see it's no parking. And, uh, you, you know, they said, well, what are you smoking anyway? Did, are you sure you saw the sign or you didn't see the sign? How could you miss that? Oh, I didn't do it. You look back up at the office. The window that leads into the office. You see all these people gathered around the window watching you. So why are they? What does it matter to them? Hey, go back in there. What does it matter to you that I'm just down here trying to find out what happened with how my car got moved? With all due respect, it didn't get moved. It it was always here. This is where you parked. You have the keys, right? Yeah, right here. Okay, then you're the only one that could have parked it there. Nobody moved it. 
I didn't park it there. I parked it over there. Now the whole Bob walks by and goes, you know, hey, but how about a, you know, a couple of dollars for an ice cream cone? I'm kind of hungry. <laughs> you know about that, don't you, Captain? Yeah. <laughs> Who is that guy? It's just a homeless uh, bum. I, why do you use the word captain? Did he know that I was in, that I served? Oh, no, forget it. He doesn't know you. Come on. What's, what the hell? Why are those people looking out the window at me? What is so interesting about this? Because you had an outburst up there. You were loud. You might have scared a couple of them. I didn't know such a listen. Why don't you go home? Get some rest. Maybe there's a little bit of PSP, TSD going on. And, you know, here's a, a name of someone you can call. They'll help you. But I'm not tired. Look, go home. It's an order. Fine. Fine. Yeah, I'll, I'll smooth it out of there. Don't worry. I'll just go ahead and, you know, just, just go ahead and go home. Okay? We'll see you tomorrow. Take a couple of days. Take the weekend. I'm not that bad. I'm, I, there's nothing wrong with me, actually. You know what I mean? You're trying to get me out of here. Why, why are you doing that? No need to be paranoid. We're friends, right? Right? Amigo, we, uh, you know, you're the, uh, you're Navy. You know, I'm Marines, right? We've served. We, we, we face battle. They shot guns at us and all that. And... A lot of guys need some extra help. Here, while I'm at it, here's a present. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hey, thanks. It's, it's Kush. It's a good one. You know, go home and smoke that and just enjoy yourself. Okay. Anyway, this is a light form of uh, what you might call organized gang stalking. We started flipping into, like, riffing on that. Now, What's going on there with all that coordination? How is that possible? And the more the guy notices it, the more he gets called mentally ill. Now, why is that happening to him? Well, that's a good question. What did he do? He was in the Navy. He served. Served in combat became a captain. That's a big deal. So what was the deal? You know, what happened there? Why the, uh, the strange stalking? Why, why mocking? Why the <laughs> laughter? Why they're moving things around on his desk? With his little chirping laughter. Who, who are they? Where did they learn how to do this? Where did they get taught how to do this? Who's calling the shots? Who's the quarterback of this operation? Inquiring minds want to know. I mean, he's, you know, he could be dangerous. We you know, better, better handle this situation. Why the theatrics with this homeless guy? trying to make him feel guilty about something. And all those kind of thoughts that you might think when that's happening to you, I'm assuming it's happened to a lot of you, you know, all those kind of thoughts that you have will be used against you in a court of law or in a court of public opinion. So how do you handle something like that? In the case of a, a, a guy who was just a, a, you know, what, an insurance office, a real estate office, something like an office, you know, a corporate office of some kind, uh, you know, uh, it's, it wouldn't be too early to transfer. Uh, it would be about time for that guy to just quietly put in his uh, resignation paper and get ski daddle out of there, try to get a, a transfer. Um but I warn you, wherever he, he transfers, 
it's going to start up again with the office manager, usually the quarterback, and the rest of it. It's going to happen the same way. So what is he going to do? He's, he's having trouble sleeping. His wife is threatening divorce. He can't really pay the payments with, with all these pressures. What's he going to do? All this stuff started happening, and he has no idea why. Okay, I'm going to give you an insight now. It's going to help you. He has no idea why, so he's inquiring. Okay, number one, stop inquiring. You know what's happening. You know it when you see it. You know it when you know it. Stop asking questions. It makes you look like a schizophrenic, like you're hearing voices and your people are plotting against you. You know all that. You know that's uh, it's irrelevant. You know what they're doing is irrelevant to you. You 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 see it's happening. You don't know why. Fine, accept it. You know then. Be really nice to people as you 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 find that there's a great opportunity and you you want to you know the 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 wife kids will really love it over at this uh, new location and great opportunities for skiing and boating and all these good good things so hey you all have a great thank you so much you know and uh, maybe we'll catch each other in the flip and then get out of there if you can't do it nicely like that just um, get in the car and leave don't come back. God will take care of you. Pray to the Lord. Lord, lead me, please, in all these decisions. But the quarterback is really not the office manager. <clears throat> the quarterback is the demon, demonic programming, something that's inside them as a becoming like a hive thing. There is no rhyme or reason. They don't know why they're doing it, number one. And two... They may not be the same people tomorrow that were there today. In other words, they look the same, you know, looks like the same place and everything, but all of a sudden they're all normal. And then you go, why the hell am I leaving if everything is normal? It was just in my head. <laughs> exactly. You get fooled every time. Because you don't factor in the idea of different people. They are different and they're not. It's, it's, a, little bit, it's a little bit like a uh, parallel universes. Okay? They are not the same as the, the, the whole thing with the window and the, you know, moving, moving the car and, the, you know, they're trying to set you up for, a, you know, incarceration in a mental hospital or something. Not the same people. <clears throat> so, the bottom line is, you're not, a, you, you cannot figure it out, but there's no need to figure it out. When it pops up even a little, it's on. And it's scary when it's the whole office. When all the, you hear your name way over there, hey, hey, so it's, 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 you know, it's really crazy. We're going to get, you know, they're probably going to haul him off to, the, you, know, you know, you know what I mean? And you start hearing those things around, like they're really plotting against you. You get your coffee and you, 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 you know, they hand you a coffee, you look at it, you're like, I don't know if I should drink that. And then there's laughter. <laughs> Laughter. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this fucking idiot. <laughs> you know? And then and then you, you try to go for some help. Okay, I'm going to the police. And then they refer you to the psychiatrist. Okay? No matter where you go, that's what you get referred to. Now, I don't know why we started riffing on that, but uh, uh, does that ever change? No, that's going to be with you your whole life. Whoever said it was going to... You know, yes, you, it, you, you may not have symptoms for a while because you might be in a more cloistered environment where you're not seeing lots of people that can coordinate. But if you get out there, you run any number of people, they can be coordinated, you know, in the spirit, and then they start in, you know, they, and then they start. And they're being used as puppets, they don't even know, but they are everything they do and everything they say is orchestrated by, obviously, some genius. And uh, when you ask them, hey, man, what, what, what was going on back there? They go, whack where? What are you talking about? You were acting a little weird, but uh, what do you, you think I'm hooked in with the secretary and the guy over here and that other salesman? I, I've... But, oh man, I've 
I'm your friend, dude. Well, maybe I was mistaken, you know. I I thought you turned against me too. Well, well what about the rest of them? Uh, when? Well, you know, yesterday. I don't know. I, I, I really don't know what you're talking about. I've, I'm sorry, I, you know, but, uh, you know, if you, you, you ran out of here and you were making accusations of people and, you know, people are just concerned, that's all. So when that happens, you know, the, uh, the snake is there, coiled. <laughs> so what you've got to do right that you've got, first of all, pray, get in connection with God. God will tell you, he'll go, it's happening because the strength and power of what's happening has, they have the ability to flip stages, <clears throat> you know, to flip scenes, to flip locations. So you think you're in the same location when it's a different thing, where, where people that they could kill you. And then it can be flipped back to where they never killed anybody. You know what I mean? And then they, you know, it's a very, you know, you, it, you do not play around with that kind of stuff. If that starts happening, you get into prayer. And you try to get with people that are, you know, to pray with that, that, that you know, that you trust, that have been proven to be trustworthy all along. Because um, it's very tempting for the enemy to tempt, like, your best friend to, to betray you. You know, to be your friend and be your, you know, be the confidant and, you know, to, to confide in with secrets. And they want, they're, they're doing intel, so they want to get, you know, you to divulge secrets to your best friend. Of course, how should that hurt you? It's always worked out before, but then this time it gets leaked out to the enemy and they use it because your friend may or may not be on the up and up with, with Jesus the way you think he is or with the Lord. Because if it really is a God thing, you can't lie. It's almost like touching the sun. You'll get burned up, you know, in that context. And on the other side, when they, you know, if you lie, well, there's no such thing as being in Satan. Uh, let's tell the Satanist something. To, to be a Satanist is really, in a sense, you're, you're, you're you know, in a... Um, you know, environment in a in a you know a, a cloistered club thing, a social circle. Let's say you know that's a normal word, a social circle. And in that circle, it's already understood about all these kind of things and how to behave and whatnot. And because you're, you know, you've known that all your life, it's no big deal for you to fit into that. And that's the uh, that's a classic Satanist. Did that guy ever worship a guy with horns? No. Did they ever, you know, uh, you know, roast a baby and eat it? No. Did they kill anyone? Well, leading people to premature death, uh, causing suicidal thoughts, pulling the plug a little too early on, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you know, influencing death because they think there's power in that, and there is. Uh, yes, um, But did they ever look like, you know, the full-on Satanist or the badass with the uh, tattoo sleeves and a you know, motorcycle jacket? And, you know, all. most godly people I ever met were on motorcycles with jackets and tats and uh, piercings and long beards. <laughs> so you, you just, you know, it's it's a real thing out there. You just can't have a. Uh, you, you know, a, a, a certain, um, you just can't have this thing that if they look like that, then they're this, or they look like that, then they're this, because it's always going to be different. And I feel bad when that happens. And, and uh, you know, the, one of the ways that, that I've coped with, oh, what's it, what's it have to do with me? The only um, thing I can say what differentiates us from them it's just basically um it's really the way you're made and the way you you know just made uh, a certain way I guess there are consequences when people behave that way and connect that way to harass or bully someone you know 
and you belong to the Most High God. I mean, I, you know, if I were one of them, I'd never do that because I'd be afraid. You know, but that's what makes me more of me. They're not afraid. They're arrogant. And they think they can drive you into the ground or bully you or, you know, what they used to do with the podcast. It'd be way worse than, than you know, books or anything else I'd produce. But with, with the podcast, it would just be like everywhere. There'd be, you know, just slanderous things said, you know, just amazing things in any chat room, any area where they could get a topic going or put a thread up in Godlike Productions and then just tear me 10 new ones, you know. And this would happen, um, I mean, this would happen every week. It was, you know, to the point where actually Brother Thomas, I remember, good old Tom, you know, Major Tom in Utah, the uh, uh, the ultimate Bowie artist, he, uh, he uh, took on a new name to defend me, and he used to go defend me. You know, he used to be like, I'd have one defender, it'd be him. You know, it's always, you know, <laughs> it's interesting I share this with you. I, uh, you know, and I really appreciate that. Don't think I've ever forgotten it, uh, Tom. I haven't, if you listen to this, I've never forgotten that kind of kindness. And uh, he'd go in there and he'd, he'd give them the what for. Now, they never picked on him, per se, because he was like an anonymous name, you know what I mean? They didn't really know who he was. He was, at that time, a very prophetic person. He has a very prophetic gift. And I've, uh, I, I think it's me and Lee from Tennessee. We're the two people that know. We're like the two witnesses of this gift that he has. And I, I don't know what's happening with it now, but he, everything you're seeing now, he predicted on my show 2005 all year. And he called them communists, a communist takeover. That's exactly what it is. And let me say a couple things about, no, he predicted it. He said in his attitude was, okay, well, I'm going to live my life as best I can while I can. And for him, that meant, you know, getting back out there as a performer, writing music, performing music, you know, getting a band together, going on the road, you know. He had his kids, he had his thing, he, he raised them, he did everything. And and now, you know, here he was at that classic midlife crisis area. And he got inspired to go into music, like I got inspired to do a movie, same thing. We're not just going to lay there and die, you know, stare out the window. So... I, you know, and I applauded him for that. And then, then it became my turn to do something similar. I always thought of him as kind of like an inspiration. He, you know, because see, it's really not about age. Your age, your age is whatever you think it is. But when the gang stalking starts going down, it's because you've gotten older. I, I didn't want to say that, but I'm going to go ahead. And, I'm going to go there. Yeah. There are some of you who think that maybe it's because uh, God's power is keeping them away. No, it's, it's yes, I mean, yes, yes, God is, is protecting you, you know, and you can never pray too much and you can never be too kind to other people. You can never, you want to be a good person, you know, you want to be uh, compassionate, but as you, you know, as you get older, you know, you're no longer a threat. You're no longer considered, like, for example, um, I was a big threat on... Um, uh, the Zaf report. So there was a lot of that. No, there was murder attempt. I mean, there was uh, near death experiences. I mean, there was there was the kitchen sink. And then as I got older, you know, it was it was there, but not not anywhere as bad. Then it gets to the point where they just um, leave you alone. <laughs> well, that's their problem. Why do they leave you alone? Because you're not registered as a... See, they can't do anything without permission. They can't do anything without central command. They can't do anything without the whole group doing it. So that they, you know, prioritize. And, you know, they're going to go after the younger people that could possibly be a threat, cut them off, so that their ideas or what they're saying doesn't get out there. Now, what did I talk about? Leaving L.A. I talked about the, uh, you know, cause stalking, gang stalking, bullying... Um, also about, uh, you know, uh, satanic uh, ritual, satanic ritual abuse, uh, escaping from that situation. And I had to, I had to go public with it because, um, because our lives were in, in, in danger. You know, I did not kill myself. I was telling people. And, uh, so that's why we had to, to, to speak up on it. I didn't speak up on it because I wanted to get anyone in trouble. I had to speak up on it because I, we were being, 
you know, stalked and, and, and you know, death threats and, and all that. For So when we went on the air, at least it's out in the open and mitigates it somewhat because there you are. Uh, and uh, that that is the only protection we had is to trust God and to be completely open in public about things. And then we got mocked, you know, by, you know, the George Norries of the world and what else about, you know, you know, do they really put a knife and a baby? You know, you put like this guy's obviously very naive, even though he was in military intelligence. He doesn't understand that the basic orientation of the world, the, the satanic world is based on, you know, um, war, human sacrifice, the, the rituals. They have a very elaborate rituals and they involve sacrifice. They involve all this stuff, but they bury it so no one thinks that and that's fine. And yeah, they're obsessed with sex and children and, you know, on and on and on and on. And the aliens, they want children. They want to change the children. The DNA thing is also another component. There's a scientific component to it, too. It's all interlocked together. Now, we explained all that early on in 2002. And I actually had doctors giving me certificates that I have a sound mind and, and uh, because he said, you might need that if they haul you, you know, they haul you off. What I said then, now I've been completely vindicated. It's all true. You know, what I said then about the whole thing, even human trafficking, it's all true. You're learning about every single day in Pakistan, every single day in Hollywood, every single day with these orphanages and the CPS. You learned about all of it. All of it was true, even more than what I had said. I was simply trying to explain that I'm a, a survivor and I'm trying to survive. I wasn't concerned with reputation or being able to make a living or anything like that. I had to, you know, be able to survive. And I did get donations. I did get, so, you know, some book sales and some things that, that you know, helped me when I, when I you know, really needed it. Because I didn't have, there was no umbrella. There was no, you know, nice place where it's all warm and I could be invited. The only invitation I got was if you... If you stop noticing all that stuff, I said, it's not that I noticed it. I went th through it, but stop with that, accept it as normal, and all is forgiven. Well, I already knew that nothing is forgiven, and uh, I'm not that stupid. But, you know, that's why I went out on the air. I, I came on the air to survive myself, not to expose them. That wasn't the goal. The goal was, can I, can, can I have a life too? The answer that I was given is no, you're good, that's it. So I have been, I've had a freer, I guess a freer life, a freer existence in, as a bondage and, you know, as a, in, in bonds to, to, to Jesus, to the Lord. And bound up like that in 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 um, you know consciousness and you know and 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 you know resisting of sin and repentance and all that. I've been more free in that than than anything, and it's available for anyone. You know, my my existence before there was no freedom, and they would have their parties and their orgies and their this and that. And, you know, their 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 killings and their they weren't free. You know what I mean? They had to have all these rules. What I was trying to do, and I was successful, is I was just trying to live a life, to be able to have a life also. And they didn't want that, you know, because it's like, uh, you know, and the, what I was trying to explain was, without people like us, you know, that will seek the truth, there would be no redemption for them. But they don't care. They'll put Jesus on that cross every time. It's like, but without that, you guys would never have a chance. And then they say, well, I like it. No, you don't like it. You love your children, right? You love life, right? You like when things go well. You like getting a, a, a you, I know you like getting a raise, right? You got money, you like money, right? Uh, 
you like things. You 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 love your parents, your wife. You you love your children. You're not really cut out to be a Satanist. They're just leaving. That you, you you're part of the infrastructure because they don't have to worry about you. But if you were to get in trouble. And they were suddenly, you know, doing that whole stocking thing around you. You know, you could see you're being set up. If that happened, and if that happens, I guess it's going to happen to one of you out there. Well, maybe this is good. Listen up. You, you, you've got to go full. You, th there's no turning back. You repent, and you've got to get to Jesus. You've got to find a way there. Jesus is not what you think it is. It is not what you think it is. It's as much a door a portal as anything else. But that's where you have to be. Even if you wind up dead, at least, um, you know, the, 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 you know you, you, you are set free because what does the truth do? Most people don't believe me. And I tell them, you know what Jesus' name really is? It's truth. Period. I mean, I mean objective word truth. And they don't know what that means. And I, and I, 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 I well, I've, I've learned a lot the last week about where people are intellectually, and, and uh, it's uh, frightening. <laughs> it's frightening. I don't know. Is there is there a lack of salvation and stupidity? Is there like a stupidity curse where you can get so stupid that you don't even know what what the point is of anything? You know what I mean? You're just like stupidly going along with wherever they, you know, like a little amoeba or something in a Petri dish. Uh, you know, could it, is that a curse? Is, is, is God cutting that person off by lowering his IQ? That's a good question. I, I, I don't know. It's a horrifying thought. But then lately I've been, you know, horrified with my fellow man. I've, I've, I've thought there were more people that, that understood things. And I realize that we may have a nation of people that don't understand anything, except for a minority, perhaps, that, you know, in any nation. But it's, it's, it's quickly being, you know, under siege. So, you know, anyway, everything is out in the open now. The, you know, human trafficking, the, you know, preying upon children. Trump's whole mission was to stop the human trafficking. That was his number one goal. A lot with the economy in China and whatever he was trying to do, it you know it wound up in failure. But the point is, he made January Human Trafficking Awareness Month, and that was really the that was really like fifty percent of what I was trying to expose was that. And we wound up at the end of this cycle of being first and foremost in the in front of us. Now we need to repent because it is going away. And look, you people that are sitting in judgment of me, listen. You're all, we are all responsible for this human trafficking and destroying children. You know, whether it be at the border, whether it be through CPS, whether it be through the foster care system and all of it. I mean, you know, that, that, that uh, children have really no rights. And, and I, you have to understand something. Um, you know, most of these the, the kids, they, they never do return home. You know, they never do live more than a few years because of the... Uh, harsh conditions that they're trafficked in. And big institutions around the world are, are the guilty party. So if you've conformed to any kind of system, you're guilty of the trafficking, the this and that, you know, the, the, all the things you, you, you would be, that would be detestable to you, you, your hand would be in them, just like we pay taxes, and then they go bomb somebody, you know what I mean? We can't get away from that sin, that, that evil that is our society doing evil things. And um, the only thing that can take that off, that can create that separation, is the blood of Christ, the most valuable commodity in the history of all things that exist. The only thing that can separate you from the, the, the terrible responsibility of these 
of what we do as a nation in sinning and how we, you know, collectively bomb this and do that and steal here and elections and people disappeared and all the pain and suffering and all the terrible things going on. The blood cuts it, cuts it, done. Now that's a legal arrangement. You could still feel guilty. But from that position of separation, uh, you have the comfort knowing that you and you know your father are one because of uh, that blood. And that blood is a legal contract that says, you know, you who through belief and through free will accept this blood as payment. You are no longer a slave, no longer a commodity with a Q-SIP uh, number on your head. You no longer, you know, you are, um, you know, sovereign under the Lord. You are, but but not sovereign. You are, con you are now uh, redeemed to God through the blood of Jesus. You know, your your what made you a slave has been paid for. You are free now. And even if you do pay your taxes or do something else or help build a bridge that's going to help the enemy cross the bridge and kill a bunch of people or whatever it is, you're still exempt from the consequences of all those things in the future because that's how powerful the blood transcends time and space. It is a covenant forever and ever. As life is forever and ever with no beginning and no end, ultimately, for those who uh, can escape this situation. It's also your, your, your method of escape. You don't need to build a big starship and go through the, the portal in the sun. We talked about that. That's what the ancients would do. They build these ships, try to fly through. You know, now they're, they're debunking. Now they're saying, there are no ancient aliens. It never happened. Uh, those are all just artworks on the pyramids. They were primitive people and blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on and on like that. Doesn't matter. You uh, understand Jesus. It is a door, a portal. You have flown through the sun and you're a celestial being, right? Ultimately, get rid of time, but you, your time has arrived. You're a celestial being like a star forever and ever. You are like what it says in the book of Daniel, you are a celestial being. You have, you have made it out of here, which if one has such love for the world that they don't want to leave, God has given them a beautiful gift of free will and they can choose whatever they want to choose. But the basic, I would say, normal default position here is this, whatever this is, it's too, and even if I could be successful, I can't take it with me. I can't, you know, it's still, I'm, I'm ahead in time. And even if I have this and I get that, I'm still ahead in time. How do I ever settle down and really appreciate it? Well, you'd have to have eternal, you'd have to turn the clock off to really enjoy all that you've built for yourself. But the clock spins faster and faster. What are you going to do in death? You can't take anything with you. Not even your reputation. How are you going to stop this curse of Kronos? This, this curse of being limited in space with a body that's decaying. How are you going to, how are you going to turn that thing around? A lot of people say, well, we need life extension technology. That's how we do it. You want to extend your life in this dimension here, in this limited situation that's like, like you know, 1% reality, and you want to extend that? Well, to me, it's all reality, so yes. And because you want to be nostalgic, you want to be romantic, you want to remember the good times. The great times. You want to go back to your youth and relive those again. 
And this time, by Jove, you, you, but you can't stop the time. You can't stop the clock. You can't go back and then freeze it and go into the, to that great moment you had and just kind of freeze it and just be in that moment. Then when you do go back there, if you had the chance, I love Rod Serling, and you did get back there, you'd realize, oh, my God, I, mentally I, I thought it was a lot better than it was. <laughs> it's, it's really painful. I got beat up, I got rejected, I made a fool of. I didn't make the cut of the team, and I'm just a nerd now, and I'm, you know. I can't even have a car. But I thought this was the glory day. This is this was it, that big victory. The, you know, when the team won the basketball thing. Yeah, but I was like a, I wasn't a player. I was like a cheerleader. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I've always found that when I go back, you know, mentally, just to, to what I thought was the great time, because I, I missed it. I guess for me, one of the great times of my life was when we, uh, you know, the, the, the first day of shooting, um, you know, because, I mean, it was like I, you know, wrote a screenplay and, and, you know, collaborated and then, you know, it got bought and put into production and then there was that first day of shooting eventually after a lot of drama. And I remember being there, I was like also an extra in it and I'm, you know, uh, you know, and I, I remember, you know, I used to recount this, it was down at Paradise Cove in the parking lot. And I recounted it to uh, Yuzna, the director, and he, you know, just, just about a year ago. And I told him, remember that day? He goes, that was the best day of my life, he said. I said, mine too. I mean, I, I went through a lot of trauma, horror, all kinds of bad things. But when I arrived at that parking lot and you were sitting there in that chair, I still remember a tall chair. Then I remember my, uh, my wife at the time that you would cast this girl, Devin DeVasquez, in it, cause, and she had been a Playboy model. And I remember my girlfriend, or whatever, the girl I came back here from Italy with, all she could do is look at that girl's ass and say, mine's better, and start laughing. And, you know, I don't remember that part. That's That was horrible, you know? And, you, you know, almost like rooting for us to fail. And, uh, you know, I don't remember all the other parts of everyone yelling at people, each other. And, but if I could go back there and share this romantic notion of, of, you know, that's why we make these things, you know, that it was that, I guess, a sense of accomplishment, or I don't even know what it was, just, a, you know, everybody using their talents to bring something bigger than themselves to, to reality for people to watch. But uh, when I've really gone back and have been accurate about it, it was not, um, it was filled with lots of chaos and, and lots of jealousy, but people were jealous and there were people jealous of me. And I said, well, what did I do? I said, well, you wrote it. So therefore, you know, you and Rick are on my shit list. And, you know, I, it was just, you know, and then there was all kinds of games being played and all kinds of people jockeying for, people go crazy when they think it's like a movie and the glamour of the movie. They don't realize you're, a little independent picture that's just struggling to survive. But anyway, you know, bottom line on it is uh, it's never good going back. There is no point. I just think the same thing about the 80s. If I could go back to 19, like 1985, then I, mean, I, I have the ability to, put, to imagine that. And as I do, I, I realize I get I get disinterested in it. And I say, Well, I, I don't want to keep going forward into to 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 age here. I wanna I don't want to keep going forward and you know, blowing one day after another and getting closer to that death thing. I, I've you know, I you know, and then there's that anxiety about the timeline and then the only place I can go, seriously, is I have to get into the spirit, you know. And in that spiritual understanding, you know, a lot of times I need the comforter. You know, to have that comforting, that comfort blanket of the Holy Spirit. And what happens is I realize, when I realize it's 
no beginning, no end, and it's it's this you know ah connection, and that you know things are going to change. You know, like my dog is going to pass. You know, sometime pretty soon, and then I've got uh, other things passing, and the trees go every year, and the you know what I mean. It's just a normal thing, but I I will persist. And why do I persist? If I can be at a place of eternality, you know, eternal existence now, then it's that it, it that it's true forever. In other words, then I am everywhere at once. Then I am, you know what I mean? I'm all the way at the end and the beginning and there is no end and beginning. You know, that's the paradox. That automatically brings comfort if I can if I can access that. Because death is just like, you know, any other thing, right? Just like getting out of a car door and going somewhere else and, you know, it's going to move on. And that's the only thing from that can help with the comfort of death. I'm not saying I'm always successful, but I know that it has to, you have to go back to source. I have to be connected to the creator. I have to be in the state of not thinking about it. Like it's just automatic, um, an automatic comfort, an automatic understanding, an automatic you know, like like uh, you know, clearing of the mind. Like all thoughts are just cleared. You know, and then 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 in in that particular state, you, you're more akin to like a child. You know, and when you're in that childlike state, you can enter the kingdom of heaven. You can enter heaven within. Remember how Jesus said, you know, you got to be like these little children, or you won't enter into the you know the kingdom of heaven. And I think what he's talking about there is, you know, we have to be there now. And we can't enter in within unless we have that mind of a child, which we can't have until we clear this current cluttered, worried, fearful mind. And then we have playfulness and uh, laughing, spontaneity. You know, you, you, I've also noticed that as I get older, I things become duller if I don't watch out. They become duller, you know, dull. Yeah, it's okay. It's just a little bit muted. They start becoming dull and kind of beige, and I I gotta fight against that, man. We don't want to just beige out. <laughs> All right, it's another kind of overcast day. And I think we've had a, um, you know, wow, I just poured out, you know, poured out of the spirit on this one today. I'm not sure exactly what I'm trying to accomplish here today. I think it's to, to, to find a common thread of comfort and, and uh, connection. And I mean, I have a lot of things that I like to say I just can't encapsulate them in words I guess you know it when you know it right <laughs> can't just encapsulate them in words but I think the, the most valuable thing to me is is uh, really ultimately being being at peace within you know because from that position Nothing can happen and everything can happen, but that, that whole anxiety about death is just when that's there, not there, there's a great deal of healing. What, what's the healing that uh, we need as we go through our, into our old age? What is the healing that we need? The, the, the traumas from the past become so powerful as memories we have to, to, to we have to face them like facing dragons facing demons and slaying them you know and, and you know and so i've replayed this thing a million times i'm still not at peace with it it's like well you might have to face it and see that all of that's really just a paper tiger anyway none of that is really that important you know at all but letting it go is, and, and, you know, a lot of times I've tried to let stuff go, and it just keeps, you know, it's like, like a rubber band. It just snaps right back. I 
Anyway, we'll work on it, right? We'll work on it. We'll work on it. It's, you know, I've <laughs> while I'm working on lots of other things, and we, you know, we're working uh, hard here to to get our you know our company crazed house and all that going, and and bringing you this uh, movie. Oh, girl, next. If you're inclined, and you know you really like it, uh, you know, there's two places, not just one. But if you've given a, a review or a like or stars or whatever on on uh, IMDb or something like that, then head on over to Amazon. Amazon's good too. Let them know that, uh, you know, you, you, you know, there's just this one opinion. Because, I mean, when day one were out there, I mean, it was Slamville. You know, they just, wah, they pounced on it. You'd think, you know, do you know me? Did you really see it? It's only been out for 30 minutes. It